Okay, this is the first video in the Introduction to Symbolic or Propositional Logic series. So the first question you might have is why bother studying this? Why bother studying all these P's and Q's? And uh, here's some reasons. First, it'll help you better understand how computers work at a deep level. It'll lay the foundations for that. It'll help you better understand and do math. It'll create more logical circuitry in your brain, so to speak, neural networks. It'll help um, you learn habits of thinking that are just more logical and they become ingrained. Um, it'll help you symbolize arguments and thereby quickly and more accurately identify their validity or invalidity. So a lot of arguments you don't even have to think about the content. You can just put them in symbols in your mind and quickly see they're valid or invalid. And finally, I think it's fun and challenging. Okay? So hopefully that'll you know, keep you motivated through all this. Um, the categorical versus modern. So we're leaving the categorical Aristotelian traditional logic and moving to the modern and we're going to start with this propositional logic. The difference is that categorical logic dealt with uh, actual words and categories. Like if I wanted to say all dinosaurs are funny creatures, I would symbolize that with Aristotle's method as all SRP. But now with modern symbolic logic, the letters will represent entire statements. So um, all dinosaurs are funny would just be represented as D. It's a whole proposition that's making a truth claim that's either true or false. Right? So we're dealing with propositions, not classes, and we can do much more with modern logic. So with that in mind, let's look at an example here. S, let's say that represents the proposition that I'm wearing a blue shirt. So if S is true, then it's true that I'm wearing a blue shirt. And if S is false, then it's false that I'm wearing a blue shirt. Right? Now if not S is true, then it's true that it is not the case that I'm wearing a blue shirt. Right? And you want to, instead of just saying I'm not wearing a blue shirt, it's helpful in logic to say it's not the case that I'm wearing a blue shirt for reasons we'll see later. Okay. So um, also when you write statements, you don't want to have S represent I'm not wearing a blue shirt. Rather, you want to make it make a positive assertion and then put not S if, if you're not wearing a blue shirt. We'll see why later. Don't worry about it right now. <laughs> um, so the letters represent true or false statements, but there are some sentences out there that don't make truth claims, like um, who are you or close that door, and uh, we won't be able to translate those sentences into our uh, modern logic. So keep that in mind. It doesn't translate everything well. Here's a compound statement because it's making two different truth claims. So I'm wearing a blue shirt and I'm wearing clogging shoes, right? Um, or I'm wearing a blue shirt and clogging shoes. That would be represented as S and P or B and C. It doesn't matter what letters you use, okay? But that's a um, compound statement. So here's some practice. See if you can um, just put these into symbolic form using some letter. So for example, for number one, you might write J or just S, you know? For number two, you might write S and P, right? Number three might be, uh, I'm either clogging or singing, might be C or S. Okay, I'm going to show you the answer slide in just a minute. And there you go. Notice number four, I put dogs like cats, and then I put a not in front of that. It's not the case that dogs like cats. Right? Okay, now instead of using these little words here, like uh, and and or and not, we want to symbolize those too. We want to put everything into symbols, okay? So we introduce these five operators. You can see the first operator here, right here, is called the tilde. It's a nice name. And it represents negation. So instead of saying not or it's not the case that, I'm going to use a little tilde. And then the dot will represent and also, and it's what we call a conjunction. It conjoins two propositions. The, the V will represent the wedge. It's a disjunction. Usually um, or captures that. Um, by the way, the and is sometimes represented with an upside down V in some books. Okay. The horseshoe represents if then uh, sentences, and that represents implication. We'll go over that later. And in some books, it'll be an arrow pointing to it as a right instead of a horseshoe but we'll use the horseshoe. And then the last one is the triple bar, which represents equivalence. And that's um, if and only if statements. And in some books that's represented with arrows going both ways. Okay, so um, here's those same sentences again, uh, statements I should say, and they're represented now with letters and operators. So look at number two, John Denver is a great singer and pilot, J.P, right? Number three, I'm either clogging or singing, C. I capitalized the V. I meant to lowercase, but C wedge S, right? Dogs don't like cats, not D, and so on. Okay. All right. So let's talk about each one of these a little in a little more detail and do some um, the truth tables for them. Okay. 
And uh, if you look at the tilde, which represents negation, um, this is uh, very, let me make sure I'm going the right, yes, okay. So the tilde represents negation. The tilde is the only operator that can occur right after another operator. So if I say I'm eating green beans or I'm not healthy, that would be G, I'm eating green beans, right? G, wedge, not H. H represents I'm healthy, not H, I'm not healthy. Okay, so it can occur right after the wedge operator. It's kind of neat. Anyway, <clears throat> P, let's say P represents I'm wearing a blue shirt. That's either true or false. A statement can be true or false. Based on that, we can figure out it's not the case that P. <clears throat> so if it's true that I'm wearing a blue shirt, then it's not the case that P. It's not the case I'm wearing a blue shirt. It must be false. If it's false that I'm wearing a blue shirt, then, it mu then it's not the case um, that I'm wearing a blue shirt must be true. Okay, so that's what this truth table means. Okay, um, you just reverse the values. So see if you can translate these real quick. Monkeys don't fly, and it's not the case that if I turn in my homework, I'll ace this course, and so on. And here's the answers. Not M. Notice number two. It's not the case that the whole statement if H then A. Because they're not saying, um, if I don't turn in my homework, I'll ace this course. That would be not H then A, with no parentheses. Rather, they're saying it's not the case that, if I turn in my homework, I'll ace this course. <laughs> Look at the last one, number three, neither Clemson nor Virginia will win the championship. So it's not the case that Clemson will win or Virginia will win. Okay. Now, for number three, you might have represented it like this down here in the bottom. It's not the case that Clemson will win, and it's not the case that Virginia will win. And these two are equivalent, same thing. So you would be correct if you did it that way. And later we'll use this logical equivalence and proofs and so on. All right. Okay, the main operator is very important. Um, to, we want to understand this concept because we'll later use it, the main operator, to determine whether the entire statement is true or false. Okay. Um, it's the one operator that covers the entire statement. So, for example, my socks are not a main operator, metaphorically, because they only cover my feet. My shirt only covers my uh, waist and chest and arms. So it's it's not a main operator. But if I got, you know, into a, well, I guess, well, let's say I'm inside a tent. The tent would be a main operator because it covers all of me. Okay, so let's look at the main operators here. This will help later. If I say S and P, the main operator is the only operator and, right? If I say, let's say number six, not A or B, the main operator is or because it applies to the whole sentence, or most of it, A or B. The tilde is not the main operator because it only applies to A, not to B. Look at number two. If S and P, then Q or R. The little and dot here only applies to S and P, not to Q and R, therefore it's not the main operator. The little wedge, Q or R, only applies, uh, between Q and R, only applies to Q and R, not to S and P. So it's not the main operator. Here is the main operator, the little horseshoe, because it connects the whole. So once I know the value of the horseshoe, whether true or false, then I know the value of this whole statement. Once I know the value of this and and number one, this dot, I know the value of this whole statement. Okay, so on this slide, I'll show you the answers. And there they are. Here's the main operators. And you can kind of tell the main operator will always be outside of the parentheses, if you have parentheses, more than one parentheses. And um, this one is complex, right? And all these little brackets and stuff. But if you think it through, I think you'll see that uh, the tilde is what applies to the whole statement. None of these apply to the whole statement. The and, because the tilde here only applies to P or Q, not to um, M or B. So the and is the main operator. OK. <clears throat> The next one is the conjunction, and this is um, the conjunction is P and Q. So I'm wearing a blue shirt and I'm clogging. P represents blue shirt, Q is I'm, I'm clogging. So if both are true, I'm wearing a blue shirt and I'm clogging, then the conjunctive sentence, the main operator of P and Q, is true. But if any one of those is false, either P or Q is false, then it's false. So if I'm not wearing a, um, if I'm not clogging, but I'm wearing a blue shirt, then this P and Q is false, right? So they both have to um, be uh, true in order for the conjunct, the dot, to be true. And this is something you got to memorize. You'll you'll um, be using it over and over again, and it's helpful to talk to, through it, like with my example with blue shirts and clogging. Okay, let's do the wedge now. The wedge over here, the main operator for P or Q. Um, this is true. 
unless both disjuncts are false. And the disjunct, one disjunct is P and one is Q. Okay, now before I even get started, I'm going to explain truth tables in, a, in the next lesson. But notice when you have two letters, you're going to have four rows because you're giving all possible combinations. It's like flipping uh, two coins twice. Right, you're going to have four possible combinations: heads, 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 tails, um, tails, heads, and tails, tails. So um, that's what we're capturing here: all possible combinations. We'll get to that later. But P, I'm wearing a blue shirt, or I'm clogging. If they're both true, it's true. It's what we call an inclusive or. Um, and then, um, as long as one is true, either I'm wearing a blue shirt or I'm clogging, then this or the wedge is true. But if I'm not wearing a blue shirt and I'm not clogging, then the uh, wedge, of course, combining them um, is false. Okay. Now, um, sometimes when you have an or sentence in English, like I'm in Austin or Orlando, Florida, I'm in Austin, Texas, or Orlando, Florida, you can't represent that with um, A or O because you can't be in both, right? So this first line wouldn't apply. I can't be in both right now. So we'll learn later that you can still represent that sentence by saying A or O, but it's not the case that A and O. And we'll get to that later. Okay. The next one is a conditional. All right. So this is called material implication. And when you see if-then sentences, they'll probably be um, expressed as if P, then Q. And the best way to remember this is that it's always true unless you have a false, an um, a true antecedent and a false consequent. And I did a little um, video on conditionals that you can check out um, later. But um, so um, if it's raining, then the roads are wet. Okay, so P represents raining, Q the roads are wet. Both are true, it's true. But if it's raining and the roads aren't wet, then my statement must be false. Now if it's not raining and the roads are wet, for all I know, that's true, right? If the antecedent is false, then the uh, conditional is going to be true. It's kind of counterintuitive, and so Hurley suggests you use the example of um, if I make an A in the final, then I'll ace the course. Okay. Now, if it's false that you make an A in the final, but still true that you ace the course, well, the statement could have, the teacher didn't lie to you, so it could very well be true. Or if it's false that you made an A in the final and false that you made an A in the course, then again, the teacher didn't lie to you, so if B, then Q is true. Now, again, there's some English statements that involve causation with if, then, P, then, Q that we just need to capture in a different way. So you have to be careful, but for now, just memorize the truth table, and we'll get to those more complicated ones later. <clears throat> Finally, there is a biconditional, and this is P, and then you see three lines in Q. Okay, so this is P if and only if Q. And when I see this symbol, I think of if P horseshoe Q and if Q horseshoe P. That's basically what it means. But the bottom line is that this is true whenever P and Q have the same truth value. So I'll jump over a cliff if and only if you do, or off a cliff, right? So if you jump over, then I will, right? And vice versa. So only, Now, if you don't jump over, then I won't. So it's true if they're both false. P or Q are both false, and it's true if P and Q are both true. But if you jump over and I don't, then it's false. Or if I jump over and you don't, then it's false. So that's a pretty easy one to remember, right? Um, okay. So in the next video, I'll go over well-formed formulas and give some more practice on um, determining um, the truth of compound statements. Thanks.